Okay, good morning, everybody. And of course, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity, in particular, Professor Dane. Glenn, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll share my screen here and turn on my pointer. What I'd like to talk about today is uh, a topic that I think is really relevant for this audience, which is why I'm, I'm very delighted to be here. We've been working on this experiment at MIT now for the past few years where we are studying microparticle impacts at high velocities. And the more I do it, the more convinced I am that there's just a ton of potential here, both for fundamental understanding of plasticity and then also application-oriented research to really understand the physics behind some deformation processes. And in particular today, I'll focus on some of our work on impact bonding. The team at MIT is listed here. And um, because we've been at this a few years now, there's a growing team of students and postdocs and collaborators. But the one constant through all of this is my co-PI, Keith Nelson, uh, who really is the progenitor of the optical method that we use. Um, so we couldn't have done any, any of this without Keith. And I'm also gonna highlight our most recent papers today, uh, those from the past year and a half. And those are all written with first authors uh, on the top line here. Yu Chen Sun and Ahmed TMU. So those two are the stars of the show here today. Of course, over the years, we've had some great collaborators who've contributed to this work um, and none of it would have been possible without the generous support of the Department of Energy, BES. John Vetrano's program supports our fundamental work on plasticity in extreme conditions. Now, the experiment that we've been working on at MIT is one that we lovingly call LIPIT the laser-induced particle impact test. And I don't wanna go into too much detail, but I'd like you to visualize like a small optics table that this thing sits on. And we're basically gonna use optics to drive a mechanical test. And in our case, we use a green laser and we focus it down to a very small point in order to ablate a very small volume of gold. And that ablation is, you know, it's an explosive vaporization of gold. So it creates a huge volume change in a very short period of time. We're talking nanoseconds of time. And we use that, that volume change to launch metallic and non-metallic, for that matter, particles. So we have particles here that are on the micron scale that we launch at very high velocities. Now, in terms of velocities, we're talking about hundreds of meters per second, maybe up to a couple of kilometers per second. And those velocities are such that you can think of them as being comparable to other high rate mechanical tests like uh, you know, flyer plate impacts, Kolsky bars, what have you. But we're differentiated from those by virtue of being a micro scale test. So I think of us as being more like a micro or nano indentation at a very high velocity. And because strain rate goes as the ratio of the, of the velocity and the size, the contours here point toward high strain rates in the upper left-hand corner. And so every test that I'm gonna show you today with this lipid is actually a micromechanical test with a strain rate beyond 10 to the sixth per second. So extremely high rate micromechanical testing. And it's not just done at high rates, it's also done in a fully quantitative fashion. And this is the part that's most exciting to me. Not only can we launch these guys, but we can study deformation at these rates because coupled to the launch laser, we have an imaging laser, which is used with a very high speed camera so that we can capture the motion and impact of these particles at time scales down to nanoseconds. So very high fidelity, very high accuracy, high rate materials mechanics. Here's an example of the kind of thing that you can do with it and a demonstration of how this is a quantitative tool. In this case, our test particle is a hard alumina, which is really probably not going to deform when it strikes a soft copper substrate. And you can see here that our lipid experiment launches this particle and over a time scale spanning just about, I guess, one microsecond here, we can actually watch and measure the velocity of that particle as it comes in, strikes the substrate, and rebounds. Because we can measure these velocities with very high precision, we know exactly how much kinetic energy was deposited at that site. We know how much came in and how much went out, and therefore how much was deposited in plasticity at the contact. So here's the kind of campaign that we run when we do these experiments. We get a bunch of particles that are nominally identical in size and shape, and we launch a bunch of them at the same substrate. 
So with a very small amount of substrate, you can do a lot of tests. And that lets you vary the impact velocity and measure the response. And so our response curve, one of our most common response curve is the coefficient of restitution. This is the rebound uh, velocity divided by the inbound velocity. So this is a measure of the bounce, right? So at low velocities, we get a higher bounce and we can watch as the bounce decays with higher velocities because we are affecting a greater amount of plasticity. I mentioned that this is a fully quantitative measurement and you can see the experimental error bars on these things. Uh, these are very, high precision and high accuracy measurements on the micro scale. And so we know exactly how much plastic work went into creating the little craters. And if we then, after the fact, go look at the craters, like in a hardness test, you could sort of measure the volume of these craters. And if you know the plastic work and the volume, then you know the hardness. In our case, we do this as precisely as possible using a confocal uh, measurement of the volume of the crater. And so here we have an example where for two pure metals, copper and iron, we're able to extract the hardness in a quantitative way, except we're doing that at 10 to the seventh or 10 to the eighth per second. Extremely high strain rate quantitative hardness measurement. And of course, now when you've got data in this range, you can start to compare it to other methods at lower velocities or lower strain rates. For example, the Kolsky bar data shown here, which for years have suggested there might be an uptick in the rate hardening of these metals at high rates, and our data kind of lie uh, on a line with those, and so they might support that kind of interpretation. So I mentioned that you know I like the fundamentals here. I like that we can quantitatively measure plasticity parameters like hardness, and I'll show you some more in a minute. But I also like that we can touch on manufacturing relevant processes. And so the one that we've spent quite a bit of time on so far is cold spray or kinetic deposition. And we've enjoyed some great collaborations with Vic Champagne at ARL, who's helping you know, nurture this into a real industry now. And in many ways, it's, it's like other spray coating processes where you get a bunch of powder flying in order to make a coating. But the cold spray process is unique because it uses a special nozzle to get the particles flying at supersonic speeds. And it is the kinetic energy of the particles that enables them to stick and they stick through a plastic process, right? It's a very highly deforming plastic process that leads to the deposition of metal and the, the development of large coatings and claddings even. So we have here a, a variety of different metals and, and composites that have been sprayed. And there's a lot of interest in this field in understanding what are the best conditions to make the best coatings. Uh, what does it take to get particles to stick? How do we get full sticking of every particle as opposed to partial sticking or no sticking? And this is the kind of fundamental question that I think the lipid can contribute to, understanding what are the right conditions to affect great uh, sticking of these microparticles and development of great coatings. So in this line of work, we've done a lot of experiments where we match the impactor and the substrate. So pure aluminum on an aluminum substrate, for example, again, we measure inbound velocity, outbound velocity, and we do a whole bunch of different tests. So of course, we are probing the fundamentals of plasticity when we get a response curve like this. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. But as we go to higher velocities, we get lower and lower bounces, which, is, which speaks to increased plasticity. And at some point, we see the transition where particles stop bouncing and instead they stick. We can do that with a lot of different materials. We've done it with aluminum and copper and titanium and zinc, and they're all similar and yet all different in their details. But in terms of quantitative understanding, one of the first things you can do is take those response curves, the coefficient of restitution plotted against the velocity, and you can analyze them. And it turns out that there is in fact a really universal and interesting scaling behavior that emerges that we see in a lot of our experiments and which was explained by Wu et al uh, back here in 2003. This is a really nice paper where they said, okay, look, here's the simplest possible set of plastic impact simulations that we can think of. And they simulated elastic perfect plasticity during uh, particle impact. And they did it with a whole bunch of different materials parameters. And they showed that, you know, really there's a beautiful 
scaling relationship. This is essentially a, a scaling law that holds over several orders of magnitude of velocity, whether the target is deforming or the particle is deforming or both, everything falls on a one half power law. And so this is now a really useful analysis because we can measure a bunch of data, measure a response curve, fit it to this power law and use it to extract something about the plasticity that is quantitative. So we can do that for metals like nickel, aluminum, and zinc. We can fit this power law and we can extract an effective elastic, perfectly plastic yield strength that is governing those impact events. Now, mind you, um, these impacts are complicated, right? So we know they're not elastic, perfectly plastic. We know that these metals work hardened. We know that they rate harden. And we know that at these rates, they can even heat up and adiabatically soften. And all of that is kind of pushed under the rug. Uh, but for the moment, the test gives you one simple measure that sort of averages over all that behavior, but it is quantitative and it's a very tight, very precise measurement. So within like 10% or less, you can measure the dynamic strength of these metals at a rate of 10 to the seventh per second. So quantitative measurements of strength at high rates, there they are. What I find interesting about these is that I've also now kind of set an expectation. This is a scaling law that prevails over a pretty broad range. And so now when I think about the bonding transition, these vertical dashed lines here, that's the bonding transition for these metals where things no longer rebound at all. So their, their coefficient of restitution is off the chart down here, right? So something's gotta give. Plasticity tells you that this is how much energy you're gonna damp out. This is how much of a bounce you're gonna get. But for some reason, as you approach this threshold, there is a deviation. And we call this the divergent regime. This is where we diverge from the plasticity power law. And to me, this is a signature of something new that is happening. It's a dramatic softening. It sets on at a certain point and it leads to the formation of metallic bonds that stick the particles to the substrate. And so I wanna talk about divergent behavior. Diverging from this power law is now something that we can specifically target and study. So what is it? What's the new physics? What new phenomena set on as we approach this adhesion transition? This is actually one of the first things that we looked at uh, uh, three years ago when we were getting started on this program. We have particles like this aluminum, which we're shooting in and then we see it stick. And we wanna understand what, what is it? What separates a particle that bounces, leaving a crater from one that sticks, leaving a splat. And so we trained our camera in really to focus on the moment of touchdown here, the moment of impact. And this is a few years old and I apologize for that, but it is sort of a watershed moment for our project because this is the moment where with this aluminum particle at a very fine time spacing, we were able to see what is it that separates particles that stick from those that bounce. And the answer is that we see this new phenomenon where we have ejecta flying out from the edge of the particle. We actually capture in real time the splash of this material sort of shooting out at the impact site. And in fact, that turns out to be the fundamental new thing that's happening. If you look at these impact sites, you can see rings here. Uh, you can see the lips, the deformation where that phenomenon has taken place. And we refer to that phenomenon as jetting. Jetting is the new phenomenon that's associated with this sticking here. And now that you know that that's the phenomenon, you can kind of go in and validate that regular plasticity gives way to this jetting event that happens in this deviation regime or this divergent regime. And sure enough, all the evidence agrees with this interpretation. When particles bounce, we don't see any hint of jets or localization at that corner there. When particles stick, we see lots of evidence of those jets and localization at the edges. And now when we focus in on this divergent regime, we've been able to show that in the middle here where extra energy is getting damped out of this particle, this indeed is where that mechanism sets on. These jets are incipient in this case. And as you go to higher velocities where particles are sticking, you get much more of those jets around the edge of the contact. Last year, we were really interested in seeing whether we could see all those phenomena at once. These particles in the divergent regime, they bounce and yet they produced a jet. And so we wanted to capture on film particles that would both 
jet and bounce. And this is one example from our APL paper from 2020, where we finally, with very fine time resolution, 20 nanoseconds, we went in and this particle here, you can see it forms a jet on one side, but then it detaches and rebounds fully uh, from the substrate. So we have here the onset of a new physics, a new phenomenon, it is jetting. Jetting starts at the point where we deviate from the plastic power law, we call that di divergence velocity, and eventually at some point the particle stops bouncing, and that's the critical adhesion velocity. Now I want to throw in a quick word of caution. When people see that video and they see this sort of splash, the solid state splash that characterizes the touchdown, they often think of a liquid type splash, and that's we think not what we're seeing here. We don't think there's any liquid involved in this process. Um, you can do simulations and analyze the local heating and th there's just no reason to expect that we would get copper up to its melting point, for example. And also, um, if you look at these jets, you know, just look at this. This doesn't look like something that has melted and re-solidified. This looks like plasticity. It looks like shearing and tearing. It, it really does look like a plastic extrusion phenomenon, not a melting phenomenon. And so that's what we think is going on. In fact, we think this is literally a, a, a hydrodynamic plasticity event where we're extruding out a jet. And in fact, that's sort of known to happen. When you have a really rapid shock type event with a convergent geometry, this is when jets are known to form. In our case, we have a particle flying in and hitting a substrate. These two surfaces are clamping shut progressively. So it's a convergent V-shaped geometry. And that shape is sort of reminiscent of what you see in other shock situations, like a shaped charge, where you have a V shape that is, you know, imploding from the from the back end here, and the convergence of the shock waves lead to the formation of a jet that shoots out the middle. So that's a very well known phenomenon, and we think it's basically the same thing that we have over here, but now on the micro scale. An even closer analogy might be explosion welding. Explosion welding is a case where you take one flyer plate and you put it at an intentional angle from the substrate so that you intentionally get this closing convergent geometry. And, and there also it is a known hydrodynamic effect that you produce jets that sort of shoot down the middle. And critically in this case, the jets are functional, right? This, this jetting hydrodynamic plasticity is used to cleanse the surface and break up oxides and enable conditions conducive to metallic bonding. And that's exactly what we think this is. We think uh, these impact bonds are basically micro explosion welds and they're facilitated by jet formation, which is a hydrodynamic phenomenon. So the shock wave propagates outward when it hits this free surface, it flips into tension and a hydrodynamic jet appears. So we think that's the physics. That's the physics of the phenomenon here. And for a few years, we've been poking at that concept and trying to understand it and validate it, in fact. And so you can ask questions like, how would you test this? How would you prove that this is a hydrodynamic uh, flow problem? Well, one thing you can do is ask about scaling. Again, I love scaling behavior because it captures essential physics without being complicated. Um, and so in this case, you'd say, look, the formation of a jet is about the pressure release wave exceeding the dynamic strength locally at this point. And it's very easy to sort of write down an expression for the pressure that gets developed. So here's the dynamic pressure. It's related to the incident velocity and the speed of sound and the density and so on. But you write down the dynamic pressure. When that flips into tension, there's some proportionality relating that flip into tension. If that exceeds the dynamic strength, that's when you should have a jet form. And if you simply rearrange this equation, uh, solve the quadratic, keep the physical root, you do end up with a beautiful, simple scaling law that tells you when jetting should happen. It should happen when the velocity is high enough that it exceeds the strength and the speed of sound and the bulk modulus come into this as well. So elastic properties control the, the, the elastic waves, the shock waves, and strength, of course, determines whether we form the jet. So this scaling law has proven tremendously useful to us because it helps us design experiments that can isolate variables and test the theory. So how do you do that? Well, one of the first things you might do is you might try to isolate the dependence on strength. So if I could design experiments where the elastic properties like the modulus and the 
uh, speed of sound, if that was a constant, then I would only have to care about the strength. In fact, if I could do that, then as I increase the strength, I would linearly increase the critical velocity to achieve a bonding condition or to achieve a jet. So you can do that. So let's talk about aluminum. You start with pure aluminum. It's very soft. And now we wanna make it stronger and we'll do that by alloying it. And aluminum alloys, they're lightly alloyed. So they have almost the same elastic properties. And so we've achieved essentially an elimination of all those elastic constants in that equation, but we've increased the strength. And sure enough, as you increase the strength, so too do you linearly increase the critical velocity to achieve bonding. The second thing you can do is you can try to isolate the elastic part of this thing. You can get rid of the strength effect. One way you can do that is by focusing on highly pure metals. In highly pure metals, the strength is proportional to the bulk modulus. And so the ratio in this equation up here turns into a constant and you're left with a single dependence. And that is that the critical velocity should scale with the speed of sound. So in pure metals, you should have a very simple elastic type scaling law. And indeed, when we test pure metals, they do fall as expected on a linear scaling that goes through the origin. In our most recent work, we've extended this. So this is the critical velocity for bonding but a separate and completely independent measurement is possible now based on that deviation, that divergence from the power law. So this is the first velocity at which we diverge away from conventional plasticity. That's a separate measurement. It's completely independent of bonding. And that too exhibits this same scaling behavior. So one of the things I like about this analysis is that these metals are put in order, right? They're collect correctly li lined up by their speed of sound, but they are not lined up by any other physical metric, not by their strength, not by their modulus, not by their density. It is uniquely the case that the speed of sound lines these guys up on the scaling law. So to me, this is a very convincing set of data. Okay, so this is the situation. We can measure plastic parameters when we have well-behaved plasticity. We can also identify deviations from conventional plasticity where new things set on, such as jetting. Now, another way to think about that is, you know, here as you're impacting, you're dissipating energy, dissipating more energy, dissipating more energy, that should go on following this power law. Something else is happening in this range that is dissipating excess energy, right? So there's an extra softening going on here. Jetting is a softening event. It's, a, it's a, a damping event. It takes energy out. You can quantitatively measure that energy on the basis of these data. And in this case, we show how you know, plasticity gives you no excess energy, but once jetting starts, you dissipate excess energy up to something like six or seven nanojoules of excess energy is taken out of these particles. So one of the interesting questions is, where does that energy go? What I mean, clearly jetting is part and parcel with this, but where does that energy end up? What did it do in the material? Well, I told you that one thing that happens when you're forming a bond in explosion welding, you know that one of the things that you do is you clean the surface, you rupture the oxide. And it is clearly the case that when a particle hits a substrate, in this case, I'm talking about aluminum and copper, and these guys do have a native oxide layer, right? And that oxide layer has to be broken and ruptured, maybe delaminated, spread apart, and metal has to contact through that oxide in order to form a metallic bond that would adhere to the particle. Maybe at the edge of the contact, the jetting would even help clean that area so that you could get a good clean contact and make a bond. So oxide is something we're very interested in. Energy goes into, uh, into rupturing the oxide. Let's talk about the oxide. Here are the copper particles that we use for these experiments. And you know, these are atomized commercial powders. They're nearly spherical. They're, they're quite nice, but they are a manufacturing proposition, right? These are, are produced in large lots through atomization. And if you look at them and cut them open and use the TEM and the STEM and the EDS on these guys, you find that they do have really appreciable oxide layers. It's something on the order of 20 to 40 nanometers thick. It's a big, thick, fragile, friable oxide layer that exists on copper oxide. 
And that really matters. When these particles come down and you splat them, so this is now a cross section of a particle that is splatted onto a substrate here, you can actually see that where bonding took place is the place where the oxide was disrupted. So in this case, on the left-hand side of this particle, there's no disruption of that oxide. It cuts all the way across there and there is no uh, mixing of the metal from particle and substrate. A very clean non-bonded condition on the left. Conversely, over here on the right, we actually see the oxide layer is broken up, just like in that schematic. The oxide has been sort of rarefied and, and, and blown to smithereens and the metal is, is contacting all the way through that interface. So that's the nature of the bonding. So we did a series of experiments to try to understand as we approach the bonding condition, what, what's going on with that oxide? How much energy do we have to spend to sort of break up that oxide? And so here's what we did. Uh, and by the way, this is our geometry, thick, friable oxide on the particle, smooth, clean substrate. And now we start shooting particles at it, spanning this entire range. Now I'm gonna start over on the right here. If I'm at a high velocity, what you're looking at here is a particle that's stuck to the surface. And this orange color, that's what the native oxide looks like in this confocal microscope uh, measurement. So the color orange here, that's the color of this thick oxide. Conversely, if I do a rebounding particle over here, this is the substrate. The substrate is freshly cleaned and polished and damn near clean. It has very little oxide on it. So this is a clean surface and this is a messy surface. What we then did is started to narrow in on this divergence region. And what I wanna draw your attention to here is this one. This is a, a, a particle, this is a, a crater. So there's no particle stuck here, it rebounded. But look at these orange patches here. There are orange patches. And that we think is the oxide. It's flaking off the particles. We've damaged it, we've ruptured it, and it's flaked off. And that happened right as we went into this divergence regime. We had to verify this, so we've done a variety of different characterization methods. If you use an in-lens detector in the SEM, you can verify that when you see these sort of rust-colored patches in the confocal, you can actually go in and find flaky and delaminated scale oxide that has been transferred uh, onto those craters. So we really think that oxide rupture and transfer of oxide from particle onto substrate, in this case, that's a measure of how much work you're putting into the fracturing of the oxide layer. So we did a series of experiments. We use these confocal measurements, we back them up with all that other microscopy, but now we use image analysis to try to quantify how much area has been delaminated, how much oxide damage have we done? And we, we put error bars on that, so we have a good clean measurement. And we do it for all particles in this range. So we, we shoot a whole bunch of these guys and we study how much delaminated oxide can we measure. And in this case, we're finding that it's you know, from a few dozen uh, microns squared up to maybe 100 microns squared. So we can measure with reasonable accuracy and precision how much oxide is delaminated. And if you put it all together, you can convince yourself that with that amount of area delaminated, and if you know the fracture toughness of the oxide, which is very, very low, you can estimate how much energy you would have to spend in order to rupture that oxide. And in our case, we're finding that it's on the order of a nanojoule or two. So in this calculus here, as we approach this transition, we start jetting and the jetting leads to the flaking of oxide. And the flaking of oxide is representing roughly a third of the total excess damped energy associated with this uh, divergent regime. So that's a third of it. Where's the rest of the energy in this divergent regime going? Well, one thing that immediately comes to mind is that if you're breaking the oxide up effectively, then you're making metallic bonds. And if you make metallic bonds, then you've got to re-rupture those in the event that there is some kind of a rebound event. And so in the case of a rebounding particle, you might imagine that some small fraction of the interface has been bonded. And we estimate from images like this one that it's not very much. It's something like 5% of the interface maybe uh, gets bonded. But if you sort of take that as an approximation, uh, we think that if you bond just a few percent of area, the fracture toughness of the metal is so much higher that you dissipate quite a lot of energy out of that. And in fact, you can account for several additional nanojoules of extra energy. 
So in these impacts, you're spending a third of your energy on fracturing the oxide, you're spending probably most of the rest of it on uh, the formation and then re-rupturing of the bonds. And then of course, I wanna point out an interesting frontier area. You're losing a little bit of energy from shooting off material in those jets. Those jets actually eject matter of a certain mass and at a certain velocity. We can measure how fast that is. We've measured the ejecta velocity on the order of a kilometer per second, um, but we don't know how much mass has been lost. And so we know that it's a very, very tiny fraction of the particle. It has to be less than 0.2% of the particle mass to even be physically plausible. But this is an open area that would be very interesting for future work. All right. I need to wrap this up now, so I'm gonna bring this to a conclusion, but I wanna point out a few interesting things. So everything I've told you about today for impact bonding, it's about this, that there is sort of a power law for plasticity that, that metals adhere to when they, when they go through these impacts. And it is when we have the divergence from that power law and a softening event that we have all the interesting stuff going on. In this case, it's a hydrodynamic jetting event and the oxide rupture and the formation of a bond. You can imagine a lot of other situations where you might have a softening event. And we are studying some of these as well. So in some of our latest work, uh, we've looked at low melting point metals. Now, when you shoot a low melting point metal like tin, at low velocities, you still get this beautiful power law. So there's a plasticity power law. And if you go fast enough, at some point, you get a departure from that power law due to softening. But in the case of tin, this is not a jetting phenomenon. This is, this is a melting phenomenon. There's enough adiabatic heat to literally melt the substrate in these experiments. And we are uh, uh, quantifying that directly through microscopy and measurements of volume and so on. In fact, this is our most recent paper, which uh, just hit the press like um, a, a week or two ago. So you can look at that one. A separate physics, but a similar phenomenon. Plasticity gives way to dramatic softening. A final one that I'll mention in passing, this is unpublished, but it's some of our future work. Other materials have other softening mechanisms. Metallic glass has the mechanism of shear localization and shear banding. And we've studied a metallic glass. And again, we see beautiful plastic power law followed by a divergence regime where extra energy is damped out. And right now we're tracking that one down, but it seems to be associated to the emergence of a highly shear banded volume underneath the indenter. So with that, I'm going to bring this to a close. I will thank you again so much for this opportunity and thank you for uh, listening to the talk. And if I were going to say something briefly to conclude, I would say these impacts follow a beautiful power law scaling that governs plasticity and that allows us to do quantitative micromechanical measurements at extremely high strain rates. And when we deviate from that power law, we can even study physics that are off the beaten path, like rapid softening events, in particular uh, hydrodynamic jetting and so on. With that, I will conclude and thank you for your attention.